In this episode, we do a little. We are joined by Sobi. Sobi is the co-founder of Xpopulous, a popular shit poster on Twitter, and a longtime friend of the show. We go deep on Sobi's tardiness to the podcast episode, his background before and in crypto, how to stick around and maybe make it in this space, and why he's building Xpopulous. As always, this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Andy, Bees, and guests may own NFTs discussed in this podcast. This is Andy. Yeah, I'm Bees. Today, uh, we're fashionably late. We're here, <laughs> we're here with King Sobi. We got rugged on um, the Uber over, thanks Joe Biden. And then I don't know, well, we're going to get into how you got the wrong address because I sent you the exact Apple Maps address. But anyway, <laughs> Sobi is co-founder of X Populous, one of my dear friends in the space, someone I've known since you know way back in the day, 2017, and somebody who is just generally a good but fashionably late vibrant. Um, so yeah, we're gonna jump in. So we, how how did today happen? What, yeah, what's what went going down? on, dude? So <clears throat> I knew I was gonna get shit if I was late. I set multiple <laughs> different alarms. These texted me. I already had already taken a shower, so I'm ready to fucking go. So when these texted you, I literally was on Twitter typing out a DM to someone else saying. I think Sobi's going to rug us. Do you want to come on the podcast? I knew you were going to do some shit like that. So I like, tried to make it a big point of not being late. And then I got in the Uber and I'm like honestly half asleep in the Uber. And I put in the address for the place I was at last night. Uh, <laughs> and that's why I told you I got the wrong Because you know how like, we'll save it for yeah, the messages. Yeah. I was like, I haven't fucking texted anyone besides fucking D's. And... Uh, <laughs> Boom, bam. I like. I look at him like, oh, I was here last night. What the fuck? This isn't the right place. And then I look down and I'm like, oh, my God. So wait, where in the city were you? Uh, I don't even know, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Just It was like fucking five minutes that way or ten minutes that way. And then my Uber driver started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, bro, what the fuck? Just can you get me to my new place? And I, you just added a stop. <laughs> yeah. Like you had one stop and then you got there and you're like, oh, I checked it out. It's good. Let me go to my next. The guy literally turned around. And he's like, what are you doing? Like you just added a new location. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I thought I'd tell him like, yeah, hey, I just wrote the wrong place in because I'm like half asleep this morning. And then I'd like, I'm like, wow, I'm really waiting in this traffic. And D's the whole time has been texting me like, bro, what the fuck are you doing? Just walk <laughs> over here. I'm like, oh, I don't have a jacket. <laughs> it's fucking cold out. It's cold out there, dude. I'm chubby, so it's not that bad. And I was like, I'm going to just listen to D's advice. So I just started running. And as I'm running, this this like woman's in front of me. And she sees me running behind her, and she grabs her bag. <laughs> like, bro, I'm not going to steal it. I'm You're just- wearing a Dior <laughs> shirt. You're coming in her bag. I mean, it's really demon time out here, dude. You got the nice <laughs> Union Dunks on your shirt, running route the. I mean, jack- how do you how do you think he finances those those purchases? Got a jack a bag. Was, bag. was it a nice friend, bag? With like, was it like a Birkin? What was it? I don't fucking know. I wasn't paying attention. I was trying to fucking make it here. You weren't thinking about it. <laughs> Good answer. Just- and I'm, I'm over here, like I'm out of breath, trying to figure out like where I am, and I just see D's across the street, like laughing in the little lobby. I'm like, fuck, here we go. <laughs> but now we're here. This is one of the good good introductions of the podcast. Yeah. yeah. So, well, what do we talk about now? So, <laughs> whatever, whatever the fuck we want. So we go into um, all sorts of shit. I feel like for you, maybe we should go a little bit in your background because I feel like a lot of people just see you on Twitter talking a whole bunch of shit about <laughs> a, whole, a whole bunch of things, getting into a whole bunch of shit. But like, maybe we can go back where you grew up, and how you grew up. We we'll throw a little, we we'll throw it a little back. Um, I was, a, I was like anchor baby. So my parents are Pakistani. They're from like a little dirt village in Pakistan. I will like randomly. I've been on this weird thing this week where I've been like randomly tweeting patriot, like American patriotism. I was in, um, and so my parents immigrated here. I grew up in a small little farm town in, uh, in Sacramento because of, and then after like 9 11, I got bullied a bunch, which is whack because I'm like, dude, I'm fucking Indian. Like, I don't even do this <laughs> shit. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, whatever that, that didn't, that didn't last that long. It was like up until middle school. Um, I spent a lot, of, I have like, I had like really strict parents because they're like, Oh, if you fucking have any fun, you're going to go to, like, you're going to just become a drug addict or some shit. It's like, well, that really helped. I still smoke weed all the time, even though I haven't the last three weeks. But anyway, um, in high school, it was actually the first time I found Bitcoin. I was on this 
this is like before 4chan became like super cringe it actually like into this day outside of like b and stuff there is like good content on there mm-hmm. so i spent a lot of time on like v or i think it was v which is like the video game one mm-hmm. and then g which is technology and people were like talking about bitcoin on g and not on biz not on biz this is way before it, people, it was on g i remember uh like you could mine btc with like a cpu I, um, and at this time, I don't, I don't know why I remember this so explicitly, but it was like 2012. The medic update had just came out for Team Fortress 2, and then like the, so, the Team Fortress 2 is this kind of like class-based shooter. If like people play Overwatch, it's kind of like that type of format, or even Apex Legends to some degree is kind mm-hmm. of inspired by it. And uh, <clears throat> Team Fortress 2 is actually, if you like, you know, people always talk about Counter Strike skins. Team Fortress 2, I think, is what really set the the mold for that so the medic and, and pyro update were the updates where you can now get different weapons and different like hats so in fortnite you have like just the skin right mm-hmm. it's just one and done and <clears throat> i think counter-strike and dota and a few other games you actually have like item slots so you have like your hat you have your like arms all this stuff so in the team forges 2 community like people loved buying these hats and the game went free to play and i realized like so while you were playing the game, you would basically get a random drop. And sometimes it would be a weapon. Sometimes it could be a crate. And, like, really rarely it would be, like, even, like, a common hat, epic hat, etc. What I ended up doing was figuring out that, like, I could just buy, like, a private server. Or, like, not buy one, but, like, start one for, like, five bucks a month. And then I just ran, like, I also figured out you could run Team Fortress 2 from the command line. So it wasn't, like, graphically intense. I don't even remember what graphics cards were at back then. So... I would go to school, like run like 30 instances of Team Fortress 2 in my own private server, like remove the AFK limit. And I was like basically mining in TF2, was selling all my shit. And then <clears throat> I got banned on PayPal because um, I'm like underaged. And I like didn't know that was in chill. So they just completely kicked me off that shit. I was like, what the fuck am I supposed to do now? You didn't go beg your parents to use their PayPal? No, they were like, what the fuck is this? They're like, this is, they're like, someone's trying to scam you. I'm like, no, <laughs> mom, this is PayPal. Like, this is not a scam. So they, they wouldn't let me do it. And I was Damn. like, fuck. And there was this website called OP Skins. And it ended yeah, up being, I remember OP Skins. You remember OP Skins? Yeah. Wait, Andy, you you play hella video games too, right? Yeah, I mean, oh, I, 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 I'm, I, I never got super into Team Fortress or like Damn. CSGO. I was like a. Growing up, I was mostly console, up, up until like college. Uh, but so I like I was playing a lot of COD, nice, a lot of Halo, a lot of Madden, nice. Growing up, and then I like junior year of high school, I had like this really shitty laptop, mm. and I would play StarCraft two. Nice. I, had, I had like a buddy who was this really fucking smart kid named Phil, and he was like grandmasters in StarCraft, and so we would just play. The four of us, we play 4v4s online, and he, he would just control all of our armies <laughs> and be my buddies would just, like, fuck around. Yeah, I'm so good at micro and what the fuck. Shout out Phil, Yeah, it was dude. crazy. I haven't seen Phil in a long time. StarCraft is fucking hard. Yeah. It's really hard. I gave it, like, two months of time, yeah. and I was probably... This is 2012, when StarCraft 2 was on the MLG circuit. It was pretty big. And, like, I couldn't mentally think of anything other than cheese <laughs> yeah. I was all zerg- i would do is cloak, if, i would only cloak banshee rush that was dude, i was doing either track. zergling rushes as zerg doing three racks all in is terran or i was doing some cheese like photon cannon yeah. shit is protoss and i was playing random like i wasn't even taking the time to learn one of them i would just do random and have one cheese strat and after yeah. like two months i'm like i don't have it but then I started playing League then too, and I played yep. League. Yep. Yep. I, I, and I, I got the League right after StarCraft. Never played StarCraft again. Like, yeah, it was a wrap. Spent dude. my whole life playing League. Yeah. All we right, so, so you're on OP Skins. I'm on OP Skins, um, which is like this this website that you could sell Team Fortress Two skins, Counter Strike skins for Bitcoin. And I was like, well, cool. What the fuck? I get money now, and I would just sell the Bitcoin. I think it was like ten dollars or something at the time. It was like 2013, 2012. Um, I made it like a couple thousand dollars that summer, which was like a lot because I was like super poor or whatever and uh, helped my parents out some shit, blah, blah, blah. But OP skins, for the people that don't know, ended up getting a cease and desist from Valve. And there's like no one, I don't even care who listens to this, no one fucking uses Wax. Wax is fucking whack. EOS is fucking whack. <laughs> but OP skins became Wax, for like a world asset exchange. They had, they got like the most random sponsorship deals. They did something with like Silent Bob or some shit. But Wax is fucking horrible. I don't know what the fuck. It's, anyone... Yeah, it's awful. Remember like the Street Fighter drop on Wax? It was unusable. 
They have like they, like their team is like just a bunch of like Hollywood dickheads that like know licensing. So they're like, oh, I'm gonna get all the IP. It's like, bro, licensing all that stuff doesn't like the content or like the user experience doesn't really matter because like the internet works. Like you know what I mean? It's become a point of like, okay, obviously anyone can make a good website, but like, why are you putting this shit on EOS? Yeah. No one gives a fuck. So anyway, it became wax, whatever. I went to college. I went to UC Santa Cruz and like joined like a fraternity or whatever. And I was just kind of like a douchebag for two years. And I like was it only for two years? I... What, what, wait, wait, what, what are we calling right now? Then? No, I, I was, but I stole him. Okay, too. <laughs> I was douchebag for two years, and, I was and like, then another eight years. <laughs> Six years later, that's when we. That's when I merged. That was Sobe too. <laughs> Proof of Sobe. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, kind of forgot about crypto while I was in college. And then in 2017, um, I, I discovered Chainlink. And I was like, this is fucking sick. <laughs> Just like the idea of smart contracts and all this shit. And it didn't help that I was like reading all these crazy copy pastas on oh, 4chan. Yeah. That like, it was like all this crazy oh, the lore. Link army. The Link Army. Dude, the, it's like this guy named like Ass Marines, Blaster. Sorry, not the Army, the Marines. <laughs> the Marines. I can't believe yeah. I said Army. Yeah, the, they they might as well just be gone now. Dude. Poor Link Marines, man. Oh yeah, they're It was a good there. ride. It was a good ride, dude. It was a good ride. But I got into, got into Chainlink, started reading um, <clears throat> the Nick Zabo papers on, like, the God Protocol and all this shit. I was like, damn, this is hella cool. And then I got into crypto late 17, like, 18. It's like, lost all my fucking money, like, over, <laughs> like, like, a couple of years just trying to, like, make it. That's when I met Deez, and, like, everyone was just down bad. And I remember Architects. I was, like... Yeah, I was, like, aggressively, like, oh, yeah, smart contracts are going to change everything. And I was, like, even back then, I was, like, kind of a very upbeat, positive person. I got banned at one point. From yeah. Being- <laughs> so, like, dude, we were in this group chat. Um, I, think, I think you told me about this. Yeah. Tell the story. So, like, this group chat called Architects formed in 2018. Uh, Shout out Shower. Shower actually started GMs. Shower. If you, if you we were GMing and Architects. Yeah. Like, that, that's uh, – we were GMing long before long. The Twitter GMs. Yeah. And this group of people attracted a lot of people that I really respected in the space. Yeah. Like, uh, originally, people like CryptoCred were in there. Gainsy was in there. Dog Loom. Dog. The uh, Big Beta. Yeah. Fuck. Shout out Big Beta, dude. Like, and then friends like Lewis and, mm. you know, maybe people who aren't as big now, but were big back then. And basically, this Trill. Tr- tr- Can't okay. forget well, Trill. Trill. Trill is like. The most alpha we've got out of that group. When are we, get, when are we getting Trill on this pod? Blockhead. Dude, he's never going to leave his house. Uh, well, I'll fly to him. I don't give yeah. a No, yeah, we, we could get Trill. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, he's not going to come here. We'll go to him. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll go, go to him. him. Yeah. Um, we'll get Blockhead, too. Yeah. He'd oh, be Blockhead great. would be a good one. He'd, He'd be, be a on really good one. But if you read Blockhead's tweets, like that sums up the Discord. <laughs> the whole vibe of the Discord was basically like a Blockhead Depression. tweet in yeah. long-form conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and in 2018, everybody was, like, abusing amphetamines and, like, trying to crack some coding strategy to make it. Like, that was yeah. kind of, like, the overall vibe. Like, you had Jeff in there, right in yeah. AI, Nick right in AI. I have yeah. no idea what the fuck they were talking about in there. Uh, you know, Shower, Shower figured out how to write some He's code. He's a good developer and, now. Like, yeah, made a ton of money. He, like, like, doesn't even know He much. actually, like, cracked the code. He, and, like, like made it. Yeah, made, he actually made it. Made a comfortable amount of money, like... Good for him. Um, and that group, like Trill, I mean, Tr- Trill was in that group posting. I'll never forget the first time I realized Trill. <laughs> first time I realized Trill has exotic taste. He's bitching yeah. about scuffing an umbrella. And I'm like, dude, what, what, what's so special about this umbrella? And he's like, oh, it's like reindeer leather from a 17th century train wreck. That no, it was like- a shipwreck. It was a salvage <laughs> shipwreck or something. Some crazy <laughs> shit. Like, like- but he was also burning his own furniture to stay warm at this time. <laughs> And I'm like, dude, what the fuck are you doing spending thousands of dollars on, like, an exotic umbrella? It doesn't even rain where you are. <laughs> like, you don't even leave the house. You got a roof. Like, you don't need an umbrella. But, like, this group of people was so interesting and special. And, like, Sobe got bullied out for being the most positive person in there. Yeah. Like, Sobe would be like, fair. check this out. Like, this might go up. Like, we might make it. And everyone would be like, fuck you, dude. Like, <laughs> We just lost all our money. Like, this is going to I don't even have anything to put into this. Like, I, I remember, like, taking, like, you remember Storm? Yeah. Uh, Storm XBT. Yeah. He came into Architects and was talking about hot. Yeah, yeah. Dude. At, like, six sats. And they I took, like, some of one. my last, like, $500 and put it in a hot, and it went to, like, basically zero. It went to zero. It was already at six sats, dude. So, it, like... <laughs> I was buying shit, like... It um, went to two. Two? It, it looked like a barcode, the fucking chart. <laughs> 
It would go from six to eight sets, and I bought it, and it went down to like three sets. It was oh, horrible. Dude. We're all in there leverage trading Those on times BitMEX. Were brutal. That was it was tough. Dude, we're dude. all on VPNs on BitMEX, getting the fucking. I was not. I was not. I would never would use BitMEX. Dude, I was getting wrecked. <laughs> yeah. I was taking like point one BTC, and that was like five hundred dollars, yeah. and just putting it on BitMEX just and just casino. losing it in like two days. Yeah. And then I'd get paid two weeks later, get another point <laughs> one BTC. <laughs> This is the long that we make it back, and then oh, ETH man. goes from six thousand to three thousand, and it's just all gone. The, the thing, thing about that though is, how many people do you think is that that's going to happen to right now in this bear market? I mean, it you has. I, I feel it's like already is happening. It's already happening yeah. for sure. It's definitely happening, and like, there's going to be a small subset of those people who stick around and make it again. Yeah. It's just a lot of people will get burnt out. The, I, I like that point, but something I want to touch on, I see on Twitter from recently, is like a bunch of like. Just new NFT people are like, if you're still here, you're going to make it. No. Like, oh, yeah, let me just the old fucking stick around and get rich strategy. It's like, dude, all those people, like now that we're talking about all all these people we mentioned, their growth as like a friend that's known them for a long time and even like your growth and Annie's, everyone's has been so nice to see. And it's it's like this interesting thing of like, like Jeff's a really good dev, Nick. So you, you have people in shower have developed all these really good like hard skills. And there's people that have also developed like pretty good soft skills of like, oh, let me put myself in a position to do something instead of like waiting around. I think the the trap that a lot of these market participants are going to fall into is that like everyone's like an NFT entrepreneur now, mm-hmm. right? And <clears throat> none of these things are like really like legitimate businesses or companies. It's just like Twitter group chats of people trying to like, oh, okay, everyone has a bunch of followers. Like, let's show some bullshit bullshit to people. Oh, like you're the only woman on the team. You get the least amount of money. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that, that's like what the fuck this like horrible community is right now. And it's um, it's like, dude, honestly, like your friends are awesome, and you should try to stick around with them. But like, you're not gonna make it making some shitty fucking NFT derivative project. Like, how about you go like apply for a job, <laughs> and, like like build yeah a company in well, the space. You know what? Well, as like a founder, I my personal opinion is the best way to make it in crypto is there's a lot of like risk that comes with being a founder and like a lot more like stress and shit. The best thing to do is become an early employee mm-hmm. at a company you find promising. Like to be honest, <laughs> yeah. you know? you're just staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, but the thing is, like for for you, for instance, so like this is like a great like place for you but there's a lot of people that actually not a lot of people at nft twitter are fucking stupid dude so there's not like a lot of d's out there but no like, there's a lot of people who like dm me and they're like oh <laughs> man i applied can you put in a good word and i'm like i really hope that like maybe i'm gonna you, put in a bad word <laughs> i'm not gonna say anything and i'm just gonna see how the process yeah. shakes out because yeah. like that happens once a week where someone's like hey i apply for this like we would have hired 300 people yeah from the people who message me that it's like we're very i feel like peculiar about who we hire and it has been like it really showed um how beneficial it was when we were all in croatia and we were all together and it was like all the vibes were good there was no zeros like i'm really big on this like vibes are a multiplicative equation and if you have one zero then like the product (laughs) of your equation is zero yeah Yeah. regardless if everyone else is like 100 out of 100 so like Going into that, it's like people need to hire. I mean, people need to apply to a bunch of things. Like, Mm -hmm. don't just like get your eyes set on one person or one company or one thing. Like, be really open to different experiences. And like, if you can get your foot in the door anywhere, it's better than just like I think kicking tires and just like waiting for that one thing to come to you. And also like actually building a history of doing something other yeah. than trading shit coins or and being able to posting. Like, or posting yeah. gm on twitter like yeah. yeah like even if it's even if what you did is shit the fact that you like spent time and energy and like tried to do something mm. and build something it's really valuable when you're trying to apply for a job and you can be like yeah look i thought this was interesting and i spent multiple months building out whatever it was it didn't work out whatever nope. like it's still way more valuable than just being like oh no i'm just waiting for the right for the right time <laughs> i've been here on twitter man i've been gming well, I, th- I think i like the devs who are on the team and they have like cool personal projects yeah. they were doing that they're all yeah. talking about they're like yeah, yeah that stuff's cool all this shit like well the, the the thing i think we do this weird thing like so at x Populous, we've been doing a good job of like attracting really good web 2 like game talent which I don't even like using the term Web 2 now because it's just fucking video game time. Yeah, yeah. I mean... It, you know what I mean? Make good content. But you have to, like... All the video games are Web 2. Yeah. So. 
But you have to, you know, explain to people like from a product standpoint how like things work. And and a thing that I've noticed is like I realize sometimes when we use like web two versus web three, a lot of times like the web two stuff has a negative context because the web three culture is what we want to see in the world, right? Of like mm-hmm. inclusiveness, like not really caring about credentials and more like merit and stuff like that. And honestly, I think anon culture is like really interesting in the sense of like, I don't know what the fuck you look like for years. You know what I mean? And I think that's what's cool is if you can remove some part, like I'm like a short little Indian man, right? So like obviously people like create biases based on that. But if you can give people a way to express themselves without the immutable labels that follow them around in like real life, I think it gives people the room to kind of be who they want to be. And uh, anyway, so the point is though, like web two skills don't have a negative context. Like honestly, what you should be like, this would be my advice. If I, like, let's say if I started in this space today, I bought a bunch of capsule houses and I lost all my money. Someone <laughs> swept my capsule houses last night. Like, thank you. Why didn't you tell, why did you hit me? Get- well, they only bought three. <laughs> I, I, I'm still harvesting a couple more, but we harvest a little losses, but I, anyway, yeah. Anyway, what I'm saying is like, let's say you, you bought the NFT top cause fucking it happens. So yeah, it there's happens a new to, paradigm. Yeah, there's a new yeah, paradigm. Just and the paradigm was that you told lose you. all your money. <laughs> the new paradigm is actually, you will own nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, what you should be doing is like, and right, the, the the huge difference is like there's so much VC capital that is always going into these new projects. So you <clears throat> probably try to pay attention to like PR newswire of like what an, fundraising announcements are coming out. If you if you look at like maybe <clears throat> you're like okay, I know Paradigm is really good at backing companies. Like they just announced this company. Like I'm gonna re- like reach out to them. Honestly, like most startups like will not hire like interns. Because it just doesn't, it's not conducive. Yeah, we always say no to it. Just, it doesn't make sense for us. It makes no sense right now, right? If you but, want to be an intern, just hop in the Discord and start participating in the community. Ex- yeah. like, like, you don't yeah. need us to say, oh, you're an intern, we're paying you. Yeah. Like, I got my start really in the space just doing everything for free and vibing with people, like helping people buy punks, yep. helping people get an art box, minting shit for people. Like, be it, a glue guy. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. I like, think- just, like we talked to Dave Krugman, and he said, like, always provide value before you ever try to extract any. You don't just yeah. show up and try to extract. And it's yeah. like the same for getting started mm-hmm. in the space. Like, you're not just gonna. Most people aren't just going to come in and find a job quickly. Yeah. But if you make a name for yourself by just participating, being social, being active, yeah. then you increase the surface area which you can have a yeah. chance to get one of these jobs. Well, like, think about... So we have, like, two part-time Discord mods who we mm. just brought on recently. And they both started out as just, like, people in our Discord who were really helpful. Oh. And we were like, hey, do you want to be a mod? And they were like, yeah, sure. And then it got to the point where we, like, were basically begging them to let us pay them. We were like, <laughs> like please come on part-time. Let us pay you. Like, you're fucking awesome. Yeah. Like, they've and- been helping us, both of them. So one of them joined our Discord in April before, mm-hmm. like, I really even knew what Fractional was. It yeah. was just, like the Discord was just open but, yeah. like, not active. But, like, he knew about it dead early Chad. and was active right on the release. And then the other mod joined, like, the week we launched and yeah. has been super active since. And, like, these are people who just are great vibes, who just provided so much value to yeah. our community that it's, like, we can't ignore yeah. this. Like, yeah. we in some way have to bring them in and be, like, hey, like, you guys have been helping us for so much. Like, how can we, like, pay you to continue yeah. this? Well, it shows that, like, drive, too. And the, the thing is, like, so much VC capital, right, going into all these new companies that need to hire people. But, honestly, like, lean startups are not going to hire people that need to, like, develop into something. Right. And I, I, like, I hopefully, I don't know, hopefully, I think, I don't know if this is going to be correct or not, but I think like next cycle, because I already look at some of the people that joined this cycle. I'm like, damn, these guys are smart as fuck. Like, we thank, got a lot of nerds coming in. Yeah. It's like, thank God I was early to this shit. Like, I would be <laughs> fucked right now. Right. And like, For next real. cycle, what the fuck are you going to do when there's like 700 Taroons in the world all trying to get the yeah. same fucking job as you? Yeah, every single kid at U Waterloo is coming out. <laughs> yeah. They're the next best smart contract yeah. auditor. They're 17 years old. It's like, Jesus Christ, man. What the fuck? Can I catch a break? <laughs> like, I don't even know what to do. But the the thing I mean, though, is like, and I don't know who needs to hear this, but bro, you're not going to fucking make it like flipping these random fucking JPEGs because you saw, by the time you saw this shit on Twitter, it's too late. Yeah, Literally, it's too late. And <clears throat> I'm not saying you should walk away from like NFTs or any of that stuff. Like, still have some skin in the game, but like, get a job, develop skills. Don't don't check out. Right now is a really good time 
to like research things, learn things, get into new ecosystems. Don't like don't put the take the foot off the pedal or where the fuck the saying is, you know? Yeah. And it's also a really good time to if you are trying to like get into the space, figure out what companies were not just like fair weather companies and see who's still around, who's still doing shit, kind of like regardless of market conditions. And like if you can start engaging with those companies now, like then, yeah. you know, maybe they're not hiring right now because of the market and they want to make sure that they have a long runway. But when things do turn around, yeah. if you've been there for a year and you've been grinding, helping them out, yeah. you know, five hours a week, even they'll, they'll re- like recognize that operations guy, dude, glue guys. Like I think that stuff goes a long way. Yeah. Especially in the space. Cause you have so many founders who don't want to do that shit. Yeah. Like that's like for us, we have a, our COO, Sean is awesome. And like, basically he came on, I knew him from college. So like it, for me, it wasn't like a, Oh, let's start. You know, we'll see what your credentials are. I knew he'd do a good job, but like mm-hmm. me and my co-founder, we just were like, I don't want to fucking deal with all the legal, like random operation shit that we have to do yeah. and to have someone come on who was just like, yeah, sure. I'll do all of it. It's yeah. like super, yeah. super helpful. Yeah. And like match out the shot too, because I feel like Sean's such a chat. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm definitely a very type B person. I don't like know what my, the fuck that means. It's like type A are like very organized, regimented people oh, that's who not are me. scheduled and get things done. No. Type Bs are like the Lindy Walkers who are just like <laughs> the journey is more important. <laughs> type Bs are the people who run through Times Square because they're an hour late to a party. <laughs> <laughs> type, type Bs are the type that look like they might steal a handbag while wearing a Dior shirt. <laughs> Dude, why, why does she do that? <laughs> She's like, look at that dude. They- <laughs> <laughs> look at him. He must be. <laughs> but no, it's one of those things where like having that like shot just makes it so much more efficient for Andy and Nate to like do what they're good at because yeah. mm-hmm. Sean just like is a Swiss like I don't know. He just does everything. Yeah, he's like, like oh, Swiss think- Army knife of like organized, structured, yeah. powerful like Chad. work ethic. Yeah, he's he's like, oh well, yeah. I'm just gonna register us to hire people in all these states, and I'm like, I didn't even know that was something you had to fucking do. Like, I, I didn't even know, know that something you had to do because I don't do operations either. Yeah, so thank you to my co-founder Toby for doing all that shit because I didn't know you had to do, do that. Yeah, I don't know shit about that stuff. And yeah. like when it started out, we just had like a multi sig, and we were gonna pay each like pay ourselves out of it. And Sean was like, no, don't do that. I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z first, and it'll save us all this time on in the future. And I'm like, all right, dude, like whatever you say, I, 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 I don't care. <laughs> Nice. That's no, crazy. We should we should talk a little bit just about X Populous. We mentioned it. Like, how did X Populous come about? How did you form it? And kind of what's the goal behind the company? So, <clears throat> I've always been pretty bullish on gaming since like I um I was like one of the first guys I think that pivoted from like DeFi into like NFTs, and it's really like similar to Andy who like crushed it on like Top Shots. I'm like a huge basketball fan. I'm a huge Sacramento Kings fan. Unfortunately, that's tough. I'm and, a, I'm a Thunder fan, so I'm just not not any better. I mean. You guys got the Koopa Troopa toy in the chat. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you guys are really good. Like, you guys are good at I'm drafting. excited for our future. Yeah. Right now sucks. I wish I could say the fucking same, dude. Jesus. But um, anyway, like, I used Top Shots. I was like, oh, this just makes hella sense. Punks, all this stuff. But what I really started to think was, like, and Luna's actually a good example of this, is most of the DeFi shit is just, like, a recursive Ponzi. <laughs> You're like, oh, you got to buy it for the yield, bro. Like it's about the... the- roller coaster man yeah. <laughs> we were talking about yesterday with Tarun. <laughs> yield good yield good big number good <laughs> apy high i make money right but like like look at terra terra luna with anchor like and this isn't a knock on the like luna ecosystem it was actually like a lot of really talented rust developers were there mm-hmm. um but overwhelming like a lot of the tvl was just like Oh yeah, I'm gonna put my money here because it's earning me yield like eleven, twelve, whatever was it, twelve, twenty percent, twenty percent. Jesus dude. fucking Christ! I was there. It was, yeah, it was fixed, fixed return, twenty percent. Yes, yeah. on I, dollars, dude. And uh, you could go to Mem in the DGen box and lever it up. Yeah. Anyway, but, yeah, you, you started to see most DeFi stuff kind of feels more like a Ponzi hot potato thing than maybe well, some <clears> financial <throat> revolution. Yeah, but I was, I was, and I think DeFi is going to crush everything. Still, like this is going to look different than it is. But my point is basically like if recursive Ponzi's can get to these multi-billion-dollar market caps, what about like what I thought was interesting was like DeFi all stuff is just capital liquidity, like all these things like becoming more efficient in video games. And IP, like, you have intrinsic demand, mm-hmm. right? Like, people actually – this play-to-earn stuff I think people miss out on is, like, everything's going to be play-to-earn. The example earlier I was saying about Team Fortress 2, like, how is that different than an actually click farm, whatever I was doing, right, with, like, the literally running shit from a command line with TF2 instances, like, harvesting my yield, selling an OP scans for BTC, 
it's like, you know, it was obviously the process was like a little rougher. But why was I able to do that? Well, because Valve made a fucking good game, man. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? When, uh, I was, I mean, you can multi-box World of Warcraft and farm. Yeah. You can bot RuneScape and yeah. farm. You sell those currencies yeah. in the game for either crypto or real cash. Dude, even uh, I, I, was, I, I had like this two-week period where I was trying to play League again. I was playing with D's and Mrs. D's. <laughs> He stopped pretty quickly. Yeah, so oh, wait, 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 what what lane do you play? I was trying to be a jungler, dude, but then oh, shit. I just kept pressing R on Nocturne at the horrible times. Dude, he would just go in one v five, like yeah. like just diving the mid turret one v five. One of my favorite Dota. things with Nocturne is when Noct- like you have a Nocturne jungle. And they're like, all right, guys, I'm going in. And you're like so fucking far away that was, from yeah. everyone. Yeah, yeah, and they yeah, press yeah. R, they go in, they die, and they're like, where were you guys? I said I was going in. That's like, literally he's going exactly what I going from red buff to their mid tower. Yeah. While I'm, we're I'm on his at, ass. Like, I'm on his ass. They're like, dude, I'm on the other side of the map. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> but the reason I brought that up is because I spent a hell of money on skins in that two-week period. I was like. <laughs> I'm gonna become the best fucking Nocturne player. I was like, what the best? What are the best juggle t- guys? And then it got to a point where I was like, what are the most expensive skins in the game? I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna learn to play those characters. <laughs> was, I was like selecting it, but it's like this is good IP. And so the idea was like, if you can take like the financial engineering of of DeFi or like the expansion of like liquidity games with like L1s, etc., and then bring in like content that has intrinsic demand like holy shit is that a recipe for success yeah i think to some degree like you kind of saw this with apes like i always talk shit about apes on twitter but like i think you know i'm not trying to knock them right now because it's interesting to think about there's four projects that have gone mainstream crypto bitcoin ethereum doge and apes right and the delta between all of those I guess the Doge is around like longer, but it literally took the richest man in the world to shit shill Doge for it to like hit mainstream. But Apes went fucking mainstream within like nine months. Yeah, right. And it's just because it was like IP based. And I think we saw this too with like NFTs. Like it's so much easier to onboard people instead of trying to be like, dude, this is like a it's one of the first fixed yield income products on fucking chain. What the fuck does that even mean, people, dude? People don't even have the personal finance skills to understand yeah. what twenty percent APY means. Like yeah. their their student loans are at eight percent through Sally May. They don't yeah. even fucking know what that means. Right. So the the um, I always play like a lot of video games. I actually read this really good paper by Pierre's Kicks, like into the metaverse. Oh yeah, he he has a lot of really great thoughts. Yeah. On shout out to Delphi in general. Yeah, Delphi guys are awesome, man. So anyway, basically just in like late twenty twenty, started developing this thesis like. Video games are going to be what causes the mass adoption of everything. I think maybe sometimes I I think maybe I arrived there through like a biased lens also by playing video games all because I was like oh shit I got into all this stuff but more and more people have gone there and um, one of my co-founders Clement huge fucking Chad total like, Chad he lives in like Singapore and uh, I met him in a Telegram chat when we were like down bad and we. <laughs> I was talking about like one, I wanted to do something in the space with him, and at first we were, we were like thinking about doing like a venture fund. Really glad I ended up not doing that, even though it probably would have made like a lot of money, but it's just not like rewarding. No. Nah. And uh, Clement had invested in my co-founder and our CEO Toby's previous company. So Toby has uh, he worked like he like ran the IGN indie game incubator. Um, he did uh, Clan Wars. He actually developed a really um, early like. The term didn't exist back then, but like a play to earn platform called like Signal Zero, which we take or he would take like 50% of the marketing budgets that he would get from these game publishers and just give them to players. And so over time, they pushed like a few billion uh, installs. They worked a lot with like MZ, which is Machine Zone, which is the guys behind Digi Daiku and stuff. Yeah, Gabe. And Gabe, child Gabe. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> another Chad. And then our other co founder is Mark Harris, who uh, it's like fucking giga chad animator he has like an oscar nomination he's been at pixar for like 15 20 years like supervising animator on like a bunch of really like big films like really well known in the industry and we really what we wanted to do is come together and, and build a company that like our vision is to bring people all over the world to bet the best content that we can and it's been it's been fun uh so we we raised a couple rounds um I have like a bunch of really good investors backing us, like good advisors like Deeds, Faroque, blah, 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 Joe McCann, Ed Saatchi. Uh, James Fulroy is actually joining us on too, which is fucking awesome. 
Um, shout out James. Shout out James. So <clears throat> we're a game studio. We went through game studio and game publisher. So our first game um, is Final Form, which is like a collectible simulation game. Um, the point of the game is to like, you pledge your cards, you earn this thing called uh, Chromos, gets emitted from them. Use the Chromos to evolve your cards to a higher tier, higher rarity. The cards are also visually um, changing over time. And there's all... And it's a little more like passive too it's right like passive. that's the thing i like about it it's not like a game where like i need to sit here for 45 minutes and be dialed in yeah. and pay 100 yeah. contention it's like oh i can set my board yeah and let it go and it's kind it's of like mad dopamine it, it's gonna be sick over time because we're gonna launch an early access like i think october 12th i think you know, i haven't even announced the exact date but october 12th is early access and then october 16th is going to be um so we're doing a, a card set with mike tyson mm-hmm. and it's going to be iron pigeons or those are, playable card set in the game but the reason why we decided to go with an early access is because we've been working on this for like a year a little, a little bit more i think there's a lot of games that there's a lot of games even i invested in that i wish i could just get my money back because i'm like this shit is not going to come out you know what i mean yeah i've i, I think i've only invested in two so I'm yeah. like chilling but yeah i feel confident in like the ones that i bet bigger and yeah. but you know like the, some of the smaller checks i'm just and it's not a knock on those teams or anything it's like games are really hard yeah making games is really challenging. really fucking hard and so what we're focused on is indie mm-hmm. and so i don't i don't know how familiar people like people hear the term triple a and i think people associate triple a with a level of graphic fidelity it actually doesn't really have much to do with graphics like obviously mm-hmm. The, so like the way we look not even we but like the way most triple a's games are organized is like a team of a hundred or more. That's the studio size. Mm-hmm. A budget for development of a hundred million or more, mm-hmm. and then a budget for marketing of a hundred million or more, mm-hmm. and then distribution, etc. So like, AAA <laughs> games are like Grand Theft Auto, Red yeah. Dead Two, yeah, Call of Duty, yeah, like all the Rockstar guys, like Witcher, right? All these games that have like insane amounts of people going into them. Double A is, I think, I probably cap it at like seventy, um, a budget of like five to twenty, twenty-five million. Um, I think I think of like Valheim, I guess, would be a double A game, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's uh, I don't even know if single A is a thing, but like indie. So yeah. we're, we operate in the space of indie because indie games are having like a massive moment right now, just yeah. like regular games. I mean, because their distribution has gotten so much better over time, yeah. and now like, and I, I feel like people really like. I mean, I fucking love indie games. I haven't been playing as much lately. I just don't have the time. Yeah, but like. There was a long time where, like, Slay the Spire was my most played Dude, game. Dude, right? Fucking such a good game. Yeah. And, like, Monster Train, a lot yeah. a lot of really awesome, like, there's a lot of really interesting, unique genres in, in yeah. indie, too, that like just... Undertale? Yeah. Undertale's a fucking amazing yeah. game, or, like, Firewatch. There's so many, like, story-driven yeah. games and stuff. And then, like, they just literally don't work as a AAA game, because it's just, like, you don't need a $100 million budget <laughs> yeah. to make fucking Undertale. Yeah. Exactly. But you can make these fun games that... From our perspective, you de-risk it all. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think a horrible thing investors and allocators are doing in this space is allocating on a game by game basis, mm-hmm. right? Like, dude, honestly, what you're gonna do is probably just miss out. Like, the game's gonna take five years to come out if you're developing a triple A game. That shit takes a long time. Like we just saw the Grand Theft Auto Six leak screenshots. They've been working on that bitch since the last one. I mean, I was playing Grand Theft Auto Five. I feel like at the beginning of college. Yeah. And, and it's still one of the most streamed games. And it's on still Twitch. great. Yeah. Like there's still over 100 million people. I, we looked up the stats, and it was like League of Legends, Valorant, Grand Theft Auto Five. Win five M nouns Dow. You know what I mean? I mean, like we said. I mean, we're we're doing a little trying to sponsor. You know, I won't go too deep into it, but I'm on the Nouns Esports Pod, um, and we're trying to sponsor some professional teams and some of the. Need to buy a noun, dude. Fuck. Some of the companies that run these games are like fuck web 3 oh, like, 100 we don't want you to be a team in our league if nouns is your sponsor yeah it, <laughs> it's just like yeah. what the fuck like i mean the thing so <clears throat> the thing about that it's so unfortunate that that's happening because it's i think as you know it's like that whole like meme like the ironic meme like gamers are the most oppressed mm-hmm. right but like Look at what's going on in, like, uh, traditional gaming of, like, was it Activision just announced that, like, they're just going to start deleting your items? Like, they're just going to start wiping players' inventories? I didn't hear this. Yeah, they're doing that, like, December or something for their new game. They're like, they're like oh, yeah, you bought all this shit. Ha! Ah, it's psych. It's gone. And they changed the metadata on them. <laughs> yeah. They changed the metadata on them. <laughs> Wrong. 
rugged and bleeping. Max Payne V2. His <laughs> picture is <with> AC Tatum. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a little funny. <laughs> but the, the whole, like, the, the problem is I don't understand where the hate comes from. I understand where the hate comes from from the Web3 games because they all, like, pretty much suck. Yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, like, Parallel coming out because I, th- I think it's going to be, like, one of the good ones. But the, dude, those guys have been grinding their ass off, and trading card games, while they're not, I'm not saying they're easy, much easier than, you know, I mean, yeah. sure you know this, these because we play MMOs and shit, and in YouTube, Andy, like, yeah, people have been trying to make the next World of Warcraft since the first World of Warcraft. Before Burning Crusade. So, yeah. <laughs> my, my hot take about MMOs is that there will never be another MMO as big as World of Warcraft. Yeah, and that like, MMOs are like kind of a washed game type, and yeah. that people are like kind of over them. I think I I would I would agree in the sense of I think I think what WoW got right is first of all I think in general the metaverse is just us trying to chase nostalgia, mm-hmm. right? Like any time that um, you're like, oh, this may- reminds me of RuneScape, like you know what I mean? People are trying to chase that feeling of when they're like twelve years old, they just fucking got home from school, they put the pizza rolls in the fucking microwave. And you know what I mean? They put the headset on. Their fucking mom is just chilling on the goddamn couch and you're just playing World of Warcraft or uh, Modern Warfare 1 or whatever, right? Yeah. It's just that nice feeling. But I think um, I think there was like this weird transitionary point. For, and, and this kind of goes into like, well, I don't know why people hate Web3 games. Is like, because I remember, like, you know, I grew up like pretty poor or whatever. And I, I had, I spent a lot of time in like the Counter Strike and TF2 like map making communities. Mm hmm. Because you like you could just play any map, whatever any like the zombie mods or the gun game, all this stuff for just free. And um, I remember when Modern Warfare One came out, I had like fucking saved up a bunch of money to get an Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty. It was like playing with all my friends. The map pack was I think it was three maps for fifteen dollars. Was the first map pack, and I was I remember sitting there going, "Why the fuck would anyone pay fifteen dollars for three maps? Like, I could pay play in hundreds of maps for free." And sure enough, every single person bought those maps that I knew that. And then if you played with your friends and you didn't have the maps, yeah. they would they would flame you. Yes. They paid for the maps and yeah. you're queuing with them and now they can't play the maps. Then you were I, rugged. I have yeah. a hot take with the MMO comment. I think there will be an MMO bigger than WoW once AR technology is ubiquitous. I think there's going to be a... I don't like, know what like a Ready Player One kind. Yeah, of. I think there will be some big AR MMO that like mobilizes people in a mm-hmm. physical way, but like maybe until then, yeah, no, yeah. because yeah, because I, I think the challenge is like, I feel like every major game now is I like, I mean, honestly, the biggest MMO right now is is GTA. Like people yeah. doing people these, playing like, it as these, like, like an role MMO, playing, like role playing, yeah, yeah like, like I, that's I have what, a friend that's who's why a drug GTA dealer is popular. GTA. Still. Have yeah. you seen T Grizzly stream? I'm not. I don't really watch Twitch that much anymore. I, T I Grizzly, yeah. Need... T Grizzly, like for people who don't know, he like robbed a. Uh, he's like a rapper that like literally robbed like a Rolex store. Um, so he's like obviously put the shits, but he got all his like hood friends to start playing GTA, and they just basically do the activities they would in their local municipality, and just the video games instead. Like they're like, let's go rob this. Like, instead of like robbing real people, they're just robbing people in GTA, and it's hilarious. I mean. I don't hey, really anything want... to make the real straight safer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I think, yeah, there, you're coming on card games being easier to make too. I think generally is true. The balancing can be really yeah. challenging. I, I was back in college. I was like a legend Hearthstone player. Okay. And so I was playing a lot of Hearthstone at the time. Oh, that's okay, um, And like that, the hard thing with that, and like I played a lot of, I still play a lot of like TFT. That's like mm-hmm. really the only game I play. I play still. Um, is that Team Fight Tactics? Yeah, that's like the auto chess one, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of consider those to be like the evolution the of of card games in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Of like, uh, you know, you still have a deck, but it's like shared between everyone, and you have a build that you're kind of building towards. So it has a lot of similar tropes to card games, I think. Um, but that stuff's really, really fucking hard to balance. Yeah, dude. that's the hard part. But like, yeah, it's way easier to make the graphics and shit than like a shooter game. Yeah. Well, I think I think the problem is, um, so. Back on like the the map pack thing or whatever it was like, I think there was like this this divergence basically where like developers and publishers just realized they could extract so much value without providing any of it. Yeah. And what I mean by that is like, look at Valve, right? Like I've I've had like a tremendous amount of respect to Valve. Like, start off with Half Life, right? Half Life, Counter Strike, and Team Fortress Two, and actually pretty much all of their fucking big games. 
start off as mods. Like Counter Strike was literally a mod in the community. And instead of like ceasing and desisting them, you're like, oh, this is sick. How about you guys come build this with us? Mm-hmm. Right? Same thing with Team Fortress 2. Same thing with Portal. Literally, same thing with Left 4 Dead. Right? I mean, look at Dota. It's yeah. a Warcraft mod. Literally, Dota. And I mean, <clears throat> Blizzard just like ignored Dota. They're like, oh, we don't give a fuck about you, Ice Frog. And then when Dota, uh, when Valve was like, okay, we'll give you a bunch of money, come make the game, they trademarked Dota. And I remember a bunch of people in the Blizzard community were upset about it. It's like, dude, come on. But um, the point, I think the point I'm trying to make though is like, we went from we went from having like expansion packs in video games where you you would buy a fifteen dollar piece of content and it would add fifteen hours mm-hmm. to the game, right? To like, oh, this is just like a little. I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with digital items and games or any of that stuff. What I, what I'm trying to make the point about is like, I think we're getting to a breaking point now, of where like publishers have just gone extremely greedy. Yeah, greedy. We're like, okay, let's just keep extracting value, keep extracting value, and now it's getting to a point where like. It's actually kind of interesting that the first time the pushback is happening is now because of the persistence of the digital items is now in question, right? And so I think like this, what we need to do as an industry is educate people. Like I, I wrote this article like a while ago, I'm like why Web three games, which I I think we need to talk about why more often. Everyone I hear people going, oh Web three games, because I have a knee, knee jerk response to decentralized social all the time. Like I think Lens is actually an interesting social graph thing, but that's. That's not what I mean when I talk about like decentralized social. When people are like, "Oh, it's like fucking Twitter, but on the blockchain." It's like, why the fuck would I use that, bro? I'll just use Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Twitter works fine. <laughs> yeah, right. And so sometimes I think we go like we just shoehorn like blockchains into things. But like, why would Web three games work? And part, some of the things I wrote in that article article were like, the, the, this like the psyop I want to try try pushing on like Web two gamers. Like, bro, why would you buy something if you don't own it? Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't own any of this shit. You <laughs> you're literally just renting do, it. Yeah, you're just renting it. They could just rug you like whenever they want. You know? Oh, you're from Iran. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter how much you spent. Bye. And the other thing is like the markets. So that's the one thing is like, why would you ever buy something you don't own? The second thing is I think we've seen this trend of like, there's just not very good games coming out anymore because they're like they're like, oh, we'll just throw out the new Modern Warfare. Like people will buy it. You know and there's this huge opportunity for indie developers. To, so we, so one of our, one of the guys that sits on our board and one of our advisors is, is Justin Woodward, who's also like an advisor to Humble Bundle. He runs the Mix, which is the Media Indie Exchange. It's the largest in-person event for indie games, and we went there during GDC. There's actually a lot of Web three presence in GDC, like everywhere, and so I was meeting all these people that literally look like they were like they look like they need to take some rest like it's like man <laughs> please go home and like take care of yourself like go do a sauna relax or something <laughs> and there's a i remember one guy we were talking about who um you know we were we were thinking about maybe like acquiring their game or like publishing them or whatever or we weren't really, really thinking about it, but like just having those conversations and exploring like, it yeah. yeah and so i remember i this just like stuck out to me where he was like i want I would always, I wouldn't lead with like the Web3 stuff, but we would have a conversation. Justin would kind of help too. We'd have the conversation and kind of organically bring up like, well, what do you think, you know, about like Web3, mm-hmm. like NFTs and stuff. A lot of the pushback was around the environmental shit, cause, which we can thank t- like Tezos for. Fuck Tezos Foundation. You guys are scumbags. for like pushing like ETH <laughs> yeah. NFTs are killing the planet. Like, fuck you, dude. But now it uses like barely an electricity. So that 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 argument's completely normal. T- Tezos holders, all they need to look at is the ETH slash XTZ chart <laughs> and just like cope. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and just cope. What what we need to do is how do we get all of the amazingly talented artists? When I say like fuck Tezos, I mean Tezos Foundation. Yeah, not the artists. I mean, yeah. there's great art on Tezos. Great oh, yeah. artists. I own it's hundreds like, of yeah. pieces on Tezos. You like, have amazing. D- I, I fucking love Tezos, Tezos art yeah. collecting. I'm just saying, people storing their value in the XTZ yeah. token. Not gonna make it. Well, and just like Tezos' marketing strategy to grow the chain in general was like pretty seedy. Yeah, dude. Yeah, it was more like combative and like zero sum than like, hey, let's try well, it. Where do you guys think this fucking narrative came out of like, oh, yeah, NFTs are killing the planet? Because they, they did literally the polar say bear hashtag commercial. green NFTs and all their shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, dude, come on, man. It's just so dishonest. And it's actually put this huge cloud above our industry that now, thanks to the merge, which is literally the largest technical coordination thing I've ever fucking seen in the world. Um, it's but, kind of crazy. There's been like no issues, right? It's just seamless, and so the um, 
so that, that was like the first pushback p- thing, which was like, we were like, oh, okay, well, the, the easy response to that at the time was like, oh, we're just buying carbon credits and just uh, like offsetting everything and then telling them, hey, Ethereum has an upgrade that's coming that is going to make it like barely using any electricity. So by the time any of this stuff is even out, we're going to be fine. They're like, oh, I didn't know that. They were responsive to that. Um, but the thing about it was like, when I started, they were like, well, what, what would NFTs look like in the game? I'm like, hey, man, they're just the same thing as, as it is. But what was interesting about the indie guys, because people, I mean, if you look at some of the really talented indie guys, they're actually like, they'll, they'll be like game directors from AAA mm-hmm. or like AA that leave and go start their own thing. And a lot of it, they're they're trying to like create their vision. And a lot of it is because they want to make a really good game that their peers enjoy and like respond well to, right? And indie art has like, indie games have really good art, all this stuff. When I started explaining to them how they could, this could be a tool to help finance their games, they were very responsive to that. Because there was this period of like two years on Steam where like everything was early access. Yeah. Like early access, early access, and it was just it was like soft rugs. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. It was like, it was like I mean, pu- I, I, PUBG I played, area, right? Yeah, PUBG. I mean, I, I was a big uh, Ark Survival Evolved player. Nice. That game was early access for like fucking two. I think years. it just finally came out. Yeah, and now that now Ark Two is in development. Yeah. <laughs> so like the, for me, I was like, oh, early access stuff makes a lot of sense, but the issue is like there was just not that transparency sometimes with these early access games. Yeah. And so basically, I was explaining to them, oh, this is like early access. Like you're selling. Um, you're not really selling something from a speculative standpoint. You're selling like fan passes to people, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you could sell, you know, thousands of NFTs for 0.1 ETH, right? Which is 130 bucks now, or maybe probably be $15 by the time we're done with yeah. this fucking podcast. <laughs> you actually owe some money. And <laughs> <laughs> but $130, like that's, yeah, it's a little pricey, but that's not outside of the realm of what people normally pay for collector's editions for games. Oh, yeah, no, that's like the fair market value. When, yeah. you, when you would have like a new Madden come out, the yeah. like the fancy box and everything yeah. would be like 100 bucks. And then the other thing is like, okay, I know I'm getting future value because I, sh- I showed up and supported you, and now you have my wallet address and you can give me future airdrops for like concept art or whatever. Kind of like, I don't want to like spill all the whole sauce on the podcast, but like explain to them those type of concepts. They're like, they're like, what the fuck? I didn't even know that. That's awesome. Yeah. Right? And they, they almost get, like, some of you guys were talking to, they're like, oh, I'd love to figure out how to do this because I've been self-financing this game and I'm almost out of money. <laughs> you, ever, you ever read the book Blood, Sweat, and Pixels? No. It's a really, really great book. Oh, fuck, what's the guy's name who wrote it? It's like Jacob Schreier or Jason Schreier or something like that. I'll send you the link. I read it. It was really, really good. It's about just, like, how fucking hard it is to make video games. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, like, ten chapters, and each one is about a different game. Nice. And uh, it gets a lot into just, like, it goes through, like, AAA games and talks about, like, the challenges, like, Uncharted and stuff like that. And then also talks about um, a lot of, like, the more indie games. But it, it's a really good one for those who are not familiar with how hard it is to make games. I just added uh, it to my list. Yeah, it's, Jason, it's a good one. Jason Schreier. Jason Schreier, yeah. Shout out. Um my my favorite one is he talks a lot about um oh, fuck what's the game what's the it's like the um it was an indie game about like farming and shit uh Stardew Valley Stardew Valley yeah yeah so the there's one a guy chapter made it. yeah there's a chapter about Stardew Valley in particular that was really really interesting like learning about the history of how that was made and stuff all one person while his wife was supporting him dude what yeah he was living in his parents' basement yeah. and she was like living with him there supporting <laughs> That's him it was crazy. fucking crazy and then like. I, I won't spoil all of it because it's a really interesting read that chapter, but like it talks about how he like had an opportunity to sell it at one point and like get a publisher and yeah. then basically was like advised not to. And because of that made like way more money when the yeah. game was really successful. And yeah. And so like the, the, that's the point though, is like, I think it's expressing all those things. Like why, why do we need web three games? Right. It's like, well, one, you actually will own these things and will actually introduce new game loops, like new type of experiences mm-hmm. for you as the consumer to experience. Second, we already know secondary markets exist, right? But they're predatory in nature, right? They're one of I, I spent hell ETH on Wild Gold actually like two years ago. I mean, ETH was cheap. It was like mm-hmm. one of the worst trades of my life. <sighs> I'm not even like I don't even not even good at rating, bro. I just wanted to hey, play. Just with want my, good gear to to look good. Yeah. Just How do you play think with about interoperability yeah. within games? Because we were talking to Tarun yesterday, and uh, you know one of the more pessimistic sides of Web three gaming is that like. You have these items that you do own, but you can't use them outside of the game. Like, yeah. I have a CSGO skin. Okay, cool. It's on chain. Like, am I going to be able to get collateral or something? Like, 
or how so getting rid of that part but just think about like interoperability yeah. in games like how do you think about building different games that use the same items or you know items can be used in multiple yeah. games so <clears throat> really good question actually so on one end i think when people think about interoperability they start thinking of like a ubiquitous metaverse that like resembles ready player one where you can have like all mm-hmm. these different art styles and all these things that are interacting Dog, that is a hugely difficult technical problem. Yeah, shit's not coming for like twenty. <laughs> That's like recreating yeah. real life. Yeah, it, it's like to tech, we need more technical open standards. Like the Webiverse guys are actually putting a really yeah. good emphasis. Shout out to Webiverse, huge mm-hmm. chads. But the so for example, Final Form, the game that we're making, the way that we're looking at interoperability, or the way that we're like leveraging the blockchain is like, you know, a lot of marketing is like they people spend a lot of money in performance marketing to try to target the right group, right? So what we're looking what we're looking into is, you know, should I hope my co-founders don't get mad at me for saying this? But we're uh, looking into we can always cut it. Yeah, like, so cut so it the way this works is this isn't live. If you yeah, say yeah. something, you can share it with the like. We'll give you the file. It's, it's, you can it's share. gonna be fine. Okay. <laughs> if, but, right. Well, I mean, I'm just saying. So anything like, happens, we can cut it. For for Final Form, the game they're working on, that's like all these different card sets. What we're thinking about doing is like I want to make this a th- that thing that puts the collector at the core of the experience. And what I mean by that is like. You should feel like you're getting rewarded because I can look at on chain, right? I want people to feel like they're getting rewarded because they're buying the right things. What I mean by that is like what we're trying to do right now is looking into maybe figuring out a way to work with like rare pepes and like mm-hmm. create a rare pepe card set mm-hmm. that like if I can find who you're like, oh, you have all these rare pepes, like, well, here you go. Now you can use them in this game mm-hmm. and you just got them for free. But the thing is, I can like, let's say I target people with Nakamoto cards, mm-hmm. right? You know these guys have money to some degree. You have, you maybe you don't have an explicit idea, but, but you they're have, sitting on a cart that's worth one hundred and fifty plus thousand yeah. dollars, and they're not selling. Yeah. It. Or then you go look at on chain activity on ETH, right? And I look at um, some people's wallets, and they're like, "Oh, this guy was early ape guy." You know, he obviously is like into this stuff. Like he he has he owns the sandbox voxel versions of them. Why don't you try to incentivize them to come play your game? Because games are like all dominated by power law. Right, so like the top ten percent or twenty percent are responsible for eighty percent of the revenue, so you can just you, it solves that matching problem. That's like the way I view interoperability isn't necessarily like the visual standards and everything are, are the same. Mm-hmm. It's more like um, I like a, a, a KPI that I have for me internally is I want to get to a point where people for our first game Final Form, I want projects to be like, oh, we're integrated into Final Form. Because think like let's say because it's going to launch on Soul to start and then we'll move move elsewhere etc. But um, all the game logics on chain whatever. But like you know, youths just had this huge moment right um, that blew up or like yeah or like just an example of punks like punks have built this huge community or whatever. And let's say a game came out and gave you cards because you held a punk mm-hmm. and incorporated the punk IP in some way or whatever had you know um, a way to figure all that out. But you would feel rewarded. Yeah, you're like, oh, I'm I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. I'm getting the right <laughs> stuff, you know. <laughs> but like, that's that's the way I'm kind of approaching interoperability. I think that's the right way to think about yeah. it too. It's just like let's find the right people, and you know what's interesting is I almost feel like Nouns almost did this to some degree in the sense of like it. It's not exactly like interoperability, but the people that I all the values that I associated like punks with. Now it's not like I don't associate them with anymore, but. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, like, nouns is, like, kind of come that vibe now of, like, all the giga brains. Like, yeah. every time I fucking hang out with Arjun, he just shills me nouns. I'm like, dude, you're so fucking smart. Should I have buy these? And then Will Price is, like, a fucking giga chat with, like, tw- 12 nouns. Like everyone he's, our, he's our afternoon podcast. Oh, nice. I'm excited about that. Yeah. yeah, so, like, that's – the thing what's interesting is, like, people aren't – like, I view the blockchain as a tool for interactive storytelling. And so I think if you build, like, really strong IP and then you can introduce provable scarcity – that makes like the IP worth like a little bit more. It feels it makes the experience feel like a little bit more real or personal. And the other thing is like your on chain resume, like like imagine if everything you did in RuneScape was had and like if I had a D gen score for RuneScape. Yeah. Like yeah. why would I not want to try to get you to come play my game? Yeah, mm-hmm. like if you see oh my D gen score is like two thousand, I'm in top fifty, like Yeah. Yeah. That's... So the interoperability thing I think is more so gonna be like it, I, it's like a hard to express this in like explicit words, but I think what's going to end up happening is like it, the matching problem is going to like help solve on it. And like, you're going to be able to maybe the things don't keep their visual fidelity from to world to world, but to some degree 
the the amount of efforts that you put in to other games or collecting will in some degree like accrue value or like procure you value in, in other games, whether that's I you can identify someone that has a lot of like lifetime spend on parallel cards and you're like, oh hey, we're gonna um I airdrop you an NFT that gets you into a token gated Discord that gets you into our alpha for a game. Like, why would I not, like, if I was building a card game and you're like, oh, this dude's been fucking absolutely going ham on Gods Unchained and on Parallel. Like, this is a really good user. Like, like let, how, let's talk to him. What what does he look for in a game, right? That's the other thing is, like, game gamers love shit. Like, pe- people love IP, man. Like, you know, when, um like, a new Star Wars movie comes out, there's always, like, half the people love it, half the people hate it, but all of them watched it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And they, and they're like, oh, this like this is going against the source, blah blah blah. But like, for gamers, people love their games. Like, fucking ETH started because Bl- Blizzard fucked up with some goddamn warlock spell. Yeah, yeah. Vitalik <laughs> set my Vitalik warlock on like, All right, time to become a billionaire because you <laughs> fucked me over. Yeah, I'm just gonna make fucking Ethereum. Though. But it's like they're just. Like, I spent so much dude, video games. Fundamentally, like, really, if it wasn't for video games, like, preface this earlier in the call, but like when I was like getting bullied and shit, I video games gave me that like that like a little bit of fun that I needed in my life to just keep going. And I've also noticed that, um, cause I know we're almost out of time, but a point that I've noticed in general is for v- movies and, v- um, music, we don't separate people into like binary groups of people mm-hmm. that watch movies and people that don't people that listen to music and people that don't. It's like, yeah, bro, obviously I watch fucking movies. Yeah, Everyone's a gamer now. Yeah. And that's where gaming is coming to. Yeah. Is everyone's a gamer now. It's just white game. Yeah. It's just one game. And it's, it's going to be really interesting to see, but I think web three games will have the opportunity to, um, basically take some of the really good creative talent that is kind of just a wash right now. And like this weird myopia that's happening in like a web two and empower these next generation of content creators to build really good games that I think people are going to really enjoy, and I'm looking forward to seeing that happen. All right. We're getting close to time. We have a question that we ask everybody Mm -hmm. before we end the pod, and that question is, if you were to write an autobiography, what would the title be? Damn. Hmm. Sheesh. <laughs> so so maybe backstory walk- on the question is that I was on a podcast, someone asked it to me, and I was like, Holy shit, like no one's ever asked me this, so I'm gonna take this mm. and start asking people. So shout out to Ashe. I do Hemi Neutron, the title. Hemi. Hemi Neutron. <laughs> what what is the name of me? What? I don't know, I'm just kidding. I don't know. Do the fuck let me think. Um I know. I I was put the kid. The kid. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, I'm not going to steal your bag. I'm not going to steal your bag. <laughs> <laughs> what What would you put yours? A Lindy Walk. Oh, that's hard. What about you, Andy? So mine mine generally changes depending on my mood, but uh, <laughs> fuck it, we ball. <laughs> that's hard. <laughs> that's hard. We've yeah. had a little bit of time to think about yeah. it. We've asked like 10, 13 people this now. Yeah. What, what was the best answer? Um. What, what, what did Tarun say? Was it some math shit? You would put you put like an equation. No, it was a good one. No, his was good. His was like a top three. Yeah. Shit, I don't remember that. So one of my favorite memories is I was remember I was in India and like it was at night and like I was wearing you know my usual colorful shit and like this like homeless guy just follows me for two blocks. Like, are you fucking colorblind? (laughs) (laughs) And I kind of just like that. I that are you you fucking colorblind? I think that's a really. I good mean, one. Yeah. I think that that might be my favorite one we've got yet. Yeah, that was, that was really good. Because I was like, I mean, it was also like funny the homeless guys like harassing yeah. you. Like, <laughs> like, what the fuck? Like, but yeah, I, I'd probably we, do the kid. The kid. No. Yeah. The kid from Sacktown. The kid from the Woo. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having we'll, me. We'll uh, we'll have to have you again, and maybe we can uh, do a full. We'll, we'll lie to you and tell you it starts. Yeah, I'm gonna tell early. you it starts at eight thirty next time. Yeah. I'm going to show up. I woke up hella early, too. I was ready to go. I was like, fucking goddamn it. I can't let Andy win. He kicked my ass in fantasy football. He won't win this. (laughs) And he won. It's okay. We are glad that you still made it. I appreciate you Wasn't a complete rug. Maybe next time we'll get Palmer, somebody on the duo duo pod. It was nice to talk about gaming. This this has been our first pod convo about gaming. Yeah, we definitely definitely need more gaming. Yeah, (sighs) Yeah, dude. Get the parallel guys on here. Oh, for sure. sure. I'd love to, yeah. Yeah, we have a long Um, list. Well, yeah, I, I just, just uh, I just met some of them. They were in Barcelona, like right at the oh, really? tail end of my trip. Got to meet. They had like the whole art team was getting together out there. 
Damn. and a couple people. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, yeah, do you have anything you want to share or any uh any anything? show yeah, any, any promotion? Pump, pump your bags. This will this will probably air in the next um, between middle of October to Art Basel. Oh wow! Um, Final form, early access. Um, that's coming out, and then that's really just it, man. Just follow. Iron Pigeons. All right, Iron Pigeons with Mike Tyson. Shout out, out Mike. shout out Mike Tyson. Shout out Mike Tyson. I got to try to get us on the Mike Tyson pod, dude. That'd be lit. Smoking weed with Mike But we Tyson. can't show up 40 minutes late. No, 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 no. I'll yes. show up 40 minutes early. I'll knock you the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Trust me, if you're with me, I'll make sure we're not late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need Mrs. D's to just... Yeah, 100%. Like, she'll, be, she'll be with it. <laughs> but yeah, dude, that's that's just really it, man. I mean, I follow at X Populous. And, uh, you know, if you're if you're honestly, like, still grinding, there's a lot of opportunities in the space. Keep like, your head up. Yeah, just become a glue guy. You probably won't make it, but I hope you do. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Well, that's, a, that's a great way to go. That's out. a wrap. <laughs> All right.